for a Q and A uh, situation, and uh, I've got I had two or three questions that came in, and I addressed them in some uh, house to house videos, and uh, which reminds me, I think I forgot to send them to the to David for him to edit them. So Rhonda, don't let me forget that. Uh, I made a bunch of videos for David at House to House, and I forgot to text them to him. But uh, uh, but I got I got three questions in. I, I I don't have the third one on the on my sheet, but uh, um, but two of them. Well, one of them was, I thought was a really really good question, and uh, and we'll go to, we'll go to uh, we'll go to it uh, first. But the, just by way of reminder from this morning. Uh, if there if there is uh, if there is interest in uh, pursuing some studies with regard to uh, apologetics uh, with reference to for example the age of the earth uh, you know creation the age of the earth uh, dinosaurs I know Ellis is not interested in dinosaurs at all but uh, or uh, and uh, and the biblical text uh, just if you have any questions that you'd like to hear. Uh, let me know. We can we can start that uh, on uh, on Sunday nights starting this summer. Uh, probably two week be about two weeks I guess from tonight. We could no not two weeks be three weeks from from tonight. But in any event, if you have questions on that I, and you're interested, I'd be happy to to uh, pursue that for a little while as well. Um, but with regard to the questions uh, that I have before me, and this. I, I had never really considered this question, and it's a really good question. It came from it came from an individual in uh, Ghana, and uh, and the question is, uh, how could it be written that the church had all things pertaining to life and godliness before the New Testament was completed? And then there was a secondary part of that question, which was, how is it that we refer to the New Testament as the perfect law of liberty. And that's from James 1 and verse 25. Whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty, because the word perfect means complete. doesn't mean it's flawless. Uh, that's not how the word perfect is used. I mean, it is flawless, but that's not what perfect means in this particular verse. It just means the complete. He's, whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continue it therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. So how can, how can we refer to the New Testament as the perfect, or no, how can we refer to the perfect law of liberty in James 1.25 as the New Testament when that, when that verse was written, quite a bit of the New Testament still had not been written? And I thought, well, that's a good question. And uh, I, it kind of kind of got the wheels turning uh, in my mind and so I want to just spend a little bit of time thinking about that because it is, a, you know, somebody, you know, somebody might ask us, you know, I mean, I, in all my days, I've never been asked that question specifically, but I thought it was very good. Uh, you know, how is it that, how is it that the Bible could refer to itself as the perfect law of liberty? Or how can we refer to the Bible in the New Testament as the perfect law of liberty from James 1.25 when, you know, James, you know, James was not certainly not the last book of the New Testament uh, that you know that was written, and so with that in mind, I want us to think about uh, some other texts that the Bible has, and, and so we can draw them all together. Uh, for example, and, and I have in the back of my mind wondered about this, just an inkling in Jude the third verse. Jude writes to his audience. He says, "I wanted to write to you concerning our common salvation." But it was necessary for me to write to you that you earnestly contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now think about that phrase. Once for all delivered to the saints. You think, well, if it's once for all delivered to the saints, why is Jude writing what he's writing? All right? And then you have 2 Timothy uh, uh, 3, which is one of the last books of the New Testament that was written. 2 Timothy Matter of fact, 2 Timothy may well be the last book of, of, the, of, of all the, well, except for John's epistles and John's gospel. So it'd be among the last of, of the 27, but John's books would have been written uh, somewhat later, uh, probably, by, probably by close to 30 years, uh, at least 25 years. 
But Paul writes, you know, every scripture has been given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And so, you know, we have these three texts. 2 Peter uh, uh, 1 verse 3, God, according to his divine power, has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Then Jude 3 and 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And so as I pondered on this and I thought about it, I tried to break it down into, into about two or three into about two or three different segments. And, and the first is this. When the church was established, it had all that it needed to know at the time in order to function and exist. And it had it in the form of the teaching of the apostles. Because where, you know, where was the first church? You know, where was the church established? Where was the church established? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Church was established in Jerusalem. You know, and you know, where, did, you know, where did the church exist for about the first maybe six to eight, nine, ten years? Jerusalem. Or in its immediate, you know, in the immediate area around Jerusalem. You know, so, so, you know, so who's given all the instructions to the church in those first, in those first few years? It's the apostles. Because, you know, we don't find any type of dispersion until Acts chapter 8 and the, uh, and the persecution that rose against the church, uh, led by one Saul of Tarsus, who later wrote half of the New Testament, so far as the number of books is concerned. And so there's this great dispersion due to a persecution of the church in Jerusalem. And it says that the disciples were scattered abroad, everybody except... The apostles. So the apostles were still right there. And so they had so they were still they were giving instruction. And then anybody that was had been dispersed had been taught by the apostles, right? And by the way, again, we're talking about a period of a number of years between Acts 2 and Acts 8. And we don't know exactly how many years, but you know, it's probably, you know, probably more than a handful. And so you have the the direct instruction of the apostles in the immediate uh, region in and around Jerusalem. Also this, even after the dispersion, after the dispersion, the, the, uh, the, the Christians were still being instructed by the apostles. Open your Bibles to the book of, uh, of Acts and look at chapter 15. By the way, the, you know, there's a text, you, you know, the first text that I was making mention of, is uh, Acts 2 and verse 42, which is, and by the way, this was in your handout this morning, and I forgot to go over it because I was in a hurry to get done because I'd spent so much time in the first point and I didn't have time to elaborate. But you know, in the first gospel sermon on uh, the day of Pentecost, you know, after Peter laid down the instructions for how to be, how to call on the name of the Lord and how to be forgiven of sins by repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, they that gladly received his word were baptized and were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls, Acts 2.41. Then the very next verse says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, who is the they? Well, the they, you know, they is a pronoun, and it has to refer back to its nearest antecedent noun that agrees to it. And so the they of Acts 2.42 is the 3,000. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now we get to Acts 15. The dispersion is in Acts 8. You get to Acts 15, and Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch. Now, there's two Antiochs. It's not the Antioch of Pisidia. It's the Antioch in, in what we would call the Holy Land, so to speak. You know, north of, north of Jerusalem. All right? And so, now all of a sudden, Acts 15 and verse 1 says, Oh, I'm going to get back here one page. It says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, you know what no small dissension means in our language? A great big argument. No small means great big. <laughs> All right? 
That's what, no small means great big. When they had a great big argument about this, discussion, debate, it says in verse 2, they determined to send Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them that they should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. And then when they got up there, they, they met with them and after their intermediate reports on the things that have been done, it says, but some of the Pharisees, verse 5 now, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. So then we have this giant discussion that begins in verse 6 where uh, Peter uh, talks about his encounters with the Gentiles and, and all the things that pertain to, to God revealing himself to him in Acts 10 and the household of Cornelius. And then you get down into verse 12 where Paul and Barnabas talk about their experience with the Gentiles and what God had done for the Gentiles through them. And then James, the brother of our Lord, introduces a passage uh, out of Amos chapter 9 in verses 11 and 12, which is down in verse uh, 15. And he says this verse that from Amos, which was 900 years before Christ, is talking about this very thing that we're talking about, how God included the Gentiles in the gospel. So then note over into verse 24. Well, verse 22 says, It pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company. Verse 23, And they wrote this letter, and then look at verse 24. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. And so the apostles and the elders solved this matter. They wrote this letter. First of all, they noted, we didn't send those guys. You know, and they may have purported to have been, you know, they may have presented themselves as coming you know, from, from the apostles. Or, you know, sometimes people just assume that, like, you know, like in that day, if people came from the church at Jerusalem, they would just assume that these people come with some teaching or authority. But the point of the matter is that even here in Acts 15, the apostles are still handling the matters in the, in the region in and around Jerusalem and, uh, and Judea. And so, and so the church has never been without all that it needed to function. God has never left the church in alert with regard to, to uh, needed information. It's always, it's always been there. And so, so we have this first, this first uh, idea is, is that the early church had the direct instruction of the apostles. And that information was being taught to them as needed. Obviously, they couldn't learn all of it. You know, you couldn't learn all of it in one sitting. I mean, it's kind of like Jesus in, in uh, John 16. He told his apostles, there are many things I need to tell you. <laughs> Many things. After three years, there are many things I need to tell you, but you are not able to bear them now. So then what did he promise them? When I'm gone, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's going to remind you of everything I told you, and then he's going to teach you everything I've not been able to tell you. And, and specific says, he will guide you into all truth. That's verse uh, 13 of John chapter 16. And so the faith, the completed faith, was all, in other words, when, and when I say completed, all that, was need, all that needed to be known was available through the mouths of the apostles and the influence of the apostles. But then secondly, there's this. After the dispersion, people went in all directions, right? I mean, that's what dispersion means. I mean, Christians just went... You know, it says the disciples went everywhere preaching the word. And what did you know? What did the Bible? Say? You know, what did Jesus say? You will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so, when these this dispersion went into the uttermost parts of the earth, 
many of these people went with the direct teaching of the apostles that they had. But then there were others that also went with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The instruction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, there, were, there were two ways. There were two ways after the uh, there were two ways after the uh, apostles that uh, I turn it down. There we go. Uh, there were two means that the church was taught in the days after the direct influence of the apostles. Two ways. One is right here in our hands. Letters. Letters. The apostles and inspired men wrote letters to the churches. I mean, for example, open your Bible to the book of uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And verse number 15. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul says this, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions, that's the teachings, which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle or letter. By the way, Paul, if you'll go a little deeper into 2 Thessalonians, into chapter 3, and look at number um, 6, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every member who walks disorderly and not after the traditions, the teachings that you have received from us. Now go down to verse 14. If anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him. And so Paul says there's another way to be instructed, and that is through the writing of letters. And by the way, this is not on, on the outline I'm working from, but uh, even Peter recognized the writings of Paul. Isn't that right? Just, just humor me and go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's start in verse 14 to get the context through verse 16. Second Peter 3, beginning verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, talking about the, 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 the coming of Christ and, and, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the new dwelling place, says, Be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. So note that Peter identified the writings of Paul as authoritative. And, and he said, and he said, Paul wrote, he says, Paul's writing about these things too, about, about being saved and being prepared for the coming of the Lord. He says, but some of the things Paul wrote in this respect are hard to understand. You know, and if you've been here on Wednesday night and we've been digging into Romans chapter 7, it's easy to figure out why Peter said some things Paul wrote are hard to understand. Which, by the way, gives me hope. If Peter, an inspired apostle, <laughs> You know, what, you know, the, the guy who preached the first gospel sermon, the guy who preached the first gospel sermon to the Gentiles, a guy who wrote two books of the New Testament, a man who walked with Jesus, if he said some things that Paul wrote are hard to understand, then I ought not feel too bad when I read some of the things that Paul writes and I say, it's hard to understand. <laughs> I'm in good company. I'm in good company when I, when I find some of the things that Paul wrote are hard to understand. But the point is that Peter recognized the writings as authoritative. And he says, those who are unstable wrestle or rest or twist these things to their own destruction. In other words, people who take the writings of Paul, the hard ones, and make them say something they're not supposed to say, do so to their own spiritual damnation. 
So again, the reference to the authoritative. So we have, the, we have the direct teaching of the apostles. Secondly, we have the writings of inspired men. And then thirdly, we have this. Again, we're talking about the early church, not us today. How, the question is, you know, how could the early church be said to have the, 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 uh, the whole counsel of God when all of it hadn't been written yet? Here's the third thing. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I've already mentioned this. In passing, or as I introduce this, this part of, of our discussion, is that there was some teaching that was done through the, through the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you know, the, you know, the Corinthians were a long way from Jerusalem, right? Yeah, it wouldn't have been, it wasn't very feasible for them to write back to Jerusalem every time something went, went awry. You know, they did write to Paul. But even then, it wouldn't have been very, it wouldn't have been very uh, conducive uh, to unity and whatnot if you had to write to an apostle every time you had a question about something. So what does the Bible tell us? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in verse number, uh, well, we'll start in verse 8. But the entire, this entire context is talking about how the Holy Spirit gave miraculous gifts to the members of the congregation. Obviously through the laying on of apostolic hands. But he says, To one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Then you have, in verse 10, To another, prophecy. And to another, the discerning of spirits. So what we have here <laughs> is the exercise of miraculous spiritual gifts to teach the church the things that they needed to know at the time. Right? Do you see, you, you see how this works? If you weren't with the apostles and you weren't in direct contact with an apostle by letter, the miraculous spiritual gifts were also given to guide the church into all the truth that they needed. And by the way, just remember, having a miraculous spiritual gift did not keep you, number one, from misusing it. <laughs> It didn't keep you from misunderstanding it, and it didn't keep you from sin. It was just, it was just a gift that was given. So in, second, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 8, you have this word of wisdom and word of knowledge. Now the word there get, that's rendered word is the Greek word logos, which as a general practice is rendered as word. In the beginning was the word. Jesus is called the word, the logos in, in John 1 and verse 1. But there, and by the way, that, that, that word logos appears 330 times in New Testament. I mean, it's a really commonly used uh, word. But sometimes, sometimes it's rendered preaching. For example, in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to those who perish foolishness, but to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Well, the word preaching there is the word logos. Then you have uh, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 6, where, Paul, oh, Paul, where Jesus is speaking to these Pharisees, and he's talking to them about their traditions have made void the commandment of God. You have nullified and made void the commandment of God by your traditions. Talking about uh, washing hands and, and, and things of that nature. Well, guess what the word commandment is? Logos. You've nullified the word or the commandment of God. And in a general sense, this word logos could refer to doctrine. In other words, not, not the, the verb teaching, but the, but the idea of teaching. You know, it's what is taught. And so you have this word or this logos of wisdom, this logos of knowledge. Well, that's teaching. That's things that were given to people in, in the church at Corinth to teach the rest of the church. Uh, I'll give you another one. In, in Ephesians, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. And start in verse number 8. It's 
Speaking about Christ being ascended, it says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now jump down to verse 11. Let's go past the parenthetical thoughts in verses 9 and 10. It says, He gave gifts unto men, and he gave himself, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors. That word should be shepherds. That's the word for shepherds. Everywhere else in the New Testament, some shepherds and teachers. So obviously shepherds refers to elders. Now, now what were these gifts given for? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure, the stature of the fullness of of Christ. What's Paul saying here? He says these miraculous gifts were given temporarily until something would come, the faith would come, that we could all have in our hands at the same time. And by the way, that's been, you know, that's been the plea of the churches of Christ you know, in America you know, for, for two centuries now. Is that you know, we, want, you know, we want people to be unified but you can only be unified when you're all when when we're in agreement on this, and that's what Paul said. He said the gifts were given temporarily until we could all have this in our hands, so we didn't need spiritual gifts anymore. And by the way, just as as a quick aside, uh, when Paul said in Acts twenty and verse twenty eight. Take heed to yourselves, talking about the elders, talking to the elders, said, Take heed to yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. I believe he's talking about this right here. I believe he's talking about the miraculous gift to be an overseer. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some shepherds, and some teachers. He's talking about spiritual gifts here. And some men were endowed with the spiritual gift to serve as elders. Look, there's no, other, there's no other way that Paul could have appointed elders in the early church on that first missionary journey in Acts 13 and 14. Remember, you know, they went to you know, Antioch, Antioch, Lystra, Iconium, Derby. You know, they went through there, and then they doubled back and went back through in Acts 14 and said, and they appointed elders in every church. Well, the Bible says the elder is not to be a novice. You know, in First in First Timothy chapter three verse six. But when you have the spiritual gift to be given to be an elder, then that takes care of that novice problem, or the potential problem of being a novice. But the point is, is that there were three there were three means by which people were instructed in the days of the early church: the direct teaching of the apostles. The, I guess we could say four. The extended teaching of the apostles by those who were with the apostles. Letters written by inspired men. And the direct teaching or the direct influence of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you one more with regard to this direct influence of the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20. And this really gets to the heart of the question. About writing. About about. about how you could say that the faith was once for all delivered when even all the books of the New Testament hadn't been written yet. Look at what John says in, uh, in uh, 1 John 2 verse 20. He says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you what? No. Know what? You know all things. Doesn't mean they didn't mean that they literally knew every single thing. What he was saying is, you know all the things you need to know. By the way, look at the next verse. I have written this not because you do not know the truth, but because you what? Know it. So what, what does John say? I might have said Paul a second ago. If I did, I apologize. I should have said John. So what's John saying? John's saying, I'm not writing any, anything instructive to you. You already know these things. Really, he's writing 
in more of a corrective or an encouraging way for them to continue in the things that they already knew. You know, in, in, in this same epistle, chapter 5 and verse 13, you know, you, know, you know, these things we have written unto you who believe on the name of the Son of God, uh, that you might know that you have eternal life by the things that are written. So in other words, they already had it in their hands, all the things they needed to know in order to be saved and to be assured of their salvation. Now, very quickly, why would John write these things to these brethren who might be troubled about their knowledge of their salvation. Well, there was a group of people in the latter part of the first century known as the Gnostics, the Knowers. And they claimed, as we might say, uh, use some, uh, not too, too modern, but somewhat modern vernacular, they thought they were smarter than the average bear. They thought they knew more than the average person. And they tried to hold sway over people as, we're the Knowers. You know, and if you want to be saved, you got to know what we know. You know and we're not, really, we're not really all that keen on, on doling it out to you all at one time. So you're trying to exercise control over the people. And John, that's why John kept using the word know repeatedly in all, of his, in all of his writings, and especially in his epistles. He kept telling his people, and, and there's almost a play on words here, so to speak. You're being troubled by these so-called knowers, but you already know. You already know. And so, but, but note how John said, you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. He's talking about that miraculous knowledge that came through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So then, let me draw this question to a close very quickly. For us today, the New Testament is the perfect law of liberty. For us today, the New Testament is the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. But it is used by us, in a, it, it, it comes to us in a, in a different form, so to speak. And what I mean by that is, much of the New Testament was written as corrective in nature. It wasn't instructive so much as it was corrective. And what I mean by that is, they already knew what they needed to know, but they weren't doing it. You know, for example, you know, Paul wrote to Timothy, right? Not so much to instruct him, but to encourage him and correct him. You know, the church at Corinth had the spiritual gifts. They had access to know everything that they needed to know. But Paul wrote to them in a corrective nature. Almost every chapter of 1 Corinthians is corrective in nature about some problem in the church. You know, chapter 1 is the problem of, a, of a divisiveness in the church. Chapter 3 is uh, the problem of carnality and immaturity uh, in the church. Chapter 4, going beyond what is written. Chapter 5, the man with his father's wife. Chapter 6, going to law with, against your brethren. Chapter 7, matters of, uh, matters of marriage. Chapters 8, 9, and 10, eat meat or don't eat meat, you know, uh, matters of expediency. Chapter 11, the headship of the man and instruction on the Lord's Supper. You know, chapters 12, 13, and 14, spiritual gifts. Chapter 15, the resurrection. Now, think about this. Was Paul giving them instruction in chapters 12, 13, and 14, or was he giving them correction? See, they already had the spiritual gifts. But he was correcting them in their, in their attitudes toward them and their exercise of them. They didn't need to be taught that spiritual gifts exist. <laughs> they already had that. But he was writing it in a corrective way. Same for chapter 15. You know, you know, they already knew that Jesus was raised from the dead. They already knew there was a resurrection from the dead. But there were some in the church who were abandoning that doctrine based on, based on, well, we can't know everything that there is about the resurrection, so if I can't know everything that there is about it, then it must not be real. So then Paul writes, again, corrective in nature. So these were not things they didn't know. These were the things they, that they already knew but were abandoning. Now, for us, we, start, we learn by what is written that's corrective. And for us, what was written as corrective to us is instructive. For example, we don't have spiritual gifts today, miraculous spiritual gifts today. 
So, so what? You know, so then, what does First Corinthians twelve thirteen and fourteen mean to us? Well, primarily, it means that love is greater than spiritual gifts. I mean, that's kind of the heart of chapter thirteen. But what else do we learn? Well, we learned that what people are trying to pass off as spiritual gifts today is not spiritual gifts at all. Because we can read what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and compare it to what we see down the street. And those two things are not the same. So we take what is corrective for others, but it's instructive for us. Again, with regard to the resurrection, you know, think again, fifth, chapter 15, matters of the resurrection. So, so the things that were corrective to the, to the New Testament church are instructive to us. And so that's why we refer to the New Testament as the perfect law of liberty. That's why we know that in the New Testament we have all things that pertain unto life and godliness. The very fact, the very fact that these books were written, copied, distributed, and finally gathered up in a single, you know, in, into a single volume that we call the New Testament tells us that these are the things God wants us to know. These are the things that we need to know. Notice, there is nothing outside the pages of the New There is nothing outside the pages of the New Testament that we need to know in order to know how to live before God and live with our fellow man in every single relationship, whether it be husband and wife, mama and daddy, children, Christians, employers, employees, you know, deacons, elders. You know, older women, younger women, older men, younger men. The Bible addresses everything that we need to know. And when I say the Bible, I mean the New Testament specifically for us. Addresses to us everything we need to know. That's why we can refer to the New Testament as the perfect law of liberty. That's why we can know that what's been delivered contains all things pertaining to life and godliness. The early church had it. In the oral or verbal and written tradition, we only have it in the written tradition. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, I got one more. I got one more question. This is a real short one, by the way. And I'll go ahead and do it because it is pretty pretty short. Uh, the question is, uh, what? Again, this is not my question. It was given to me. What are house churches? And why do some who practice it oppose worship or assemblies in church buildings? All right? First, there is no distinction in the New Testament between a church that meets in a house and a church that meets in some other place. Whether it be a rented facility or a church-owned facility, uh, or some type of public place that, that is available for the church to meet. There is no difference in a house church and any other, and by the way, house church, I mean congregation. There's no difference between a congregation that meets in a house and one that meets anywhere else, all right? And I should also add this, even though it's not on my, my paper. You know, if there is a house church, that church is supposed to have elders, in other words, whatever, you know, whatever, wherever a church decides to meet, in whatever place or whatever means they decide to meet, there's not one particle of difference in how that church is supposed to be organized and conduct its affairs than a church that meets in a building owned by the church. All right? And so, and so you know, if there's a house church, it needs to have elders. If it's a house church, it needs to have deacons. You know, if it's a house church, it needs to practice, you know, you know, the, the, what we refer to as the five acts of worship. I mean, all of, you know, all of these things are, are specific to a congregation regardless of where that congregation meets. Secondly, I have known of a large number of house churches, not so many in the United States anymore, but, uh, but overseas. But I have never, I've never run across anybody in a house church who opposes owning a building. So whoever, you know, whoever wrote the question must know somebody that I don't know. And what I mean by that is they must know somebody who thinks you have to meet in a house. And by the way, 
The person who wrote this question, I don't even know if they're, I don't even know what their status is so far as their relationship with God according to the New Testament. And I don't know who they're referring to. Look, there's 30,000 denominations in the United States. I suspect there may be one that thinks you have to meet in the house. But I've never met them. You know, but the odds of those people existing is probably pretty strong if there's 30,000 different religious groups in America and the Bible does speak about churches meeting in house. All right? Four places. Romans 16, 1 Corinthians 16, Colossians chapter 4, and the second verse in the single chapter book of Philemon. All right? There are four places where churches are mentioned as meeting in houses. All right? So the Bible does speak about it. But the Bible does not bind a house as the meeting place for the church. Let me give you an example of why I'm really certain this is so. When Paul gave his corrective instruction, his corrective writing to the church at Corinth with regard to their abuse of the Lord's Supper, he said, you know, some have, some, you've turned the Lord's Supper into something that's never, in, the Lord never intended it to be. And some of you are just bringing a pile of food and you're all eating and having a big time. And you're calling that the Lord's Supper. And then somebody else comes in later and he doesn't have anything to eat. But y'all have already eaten and, you know, you've just made this artificial distinction in the church and you've excluded your own brethren from, from, your, from your fellowship and you've perverted the Lord's Supper. I mean, that's 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 18 through verse 21. What? what? Okay. Give me just a second. In verse 22, he says, Do you not have houses to eat in? Do you not have houses to eat in? Now, this is an inference. It's not a necessary inference. But to me, the inference is... They were not meeting in somebody's house. Or why would he say, do you not have houses to eat in? No, the church at Corinth appears to have been meeting somewhere other than somebody's house. Now here's what I find is the interesting part. In the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul sends greetings from Aquila and Priscilla and the church that is in their house. So Paul is writing to a church that doesn't meet in a house and sends greetings to that church from another church that does meet in a house. So what do we learn? We learn that the Bible, the New Testament, even though it speaks of house churches, does not bind house churches as, as the only place where the church, you know, where the church can, can meet. All right, and so, so there's no di there's no distinction between where a church meets, and in First Corinthians eleven and First Corinthians sixteen, you have two different types of churches: one that's meeting somewhere other than a house, we don't know where, being greeted by a church that does meet in a house. So I can't speak to those that oppose it, but I, I know they'd have a hard time. They'd have a hard time. Getting around to me, they have a hard time getting around First Corinthians eleven. Yes, ma'am. What is your thinking on the large congregation to have a nice building and they meet in that building in the morning? Is it then on Sunday night they go to different homes? Like small groups. That's what that's what they're generally called. They're called small. Did y'all hear the question? Some of my congregations of, of of some size, and they meet together on Sunday morning, and they then they get together in, in smaller groups and meet somewhere on Sunday night. I right, here's my here's by the way, my opinion doesn't matter. You know what the Bible says is, is the <laughs> is the standard. Is Sunday night a command or an expedient? It's an expedient. In other words, this. This church would not be in sin if it's quit meeting on Sunday night. Is that right? Can we meet on can we meet just on Sunday night? I mean on Sunday morning and not meet at all on Sunday night? We can. Right? It's been it's of course it's been the long standing decision of the eldership that this church meets on Sunday night. It's an expedient. Alright, so 
So if Sunday night isn't expedient, then what? We can do whatever we want to do on Sunday night so long as it does not violate some other passage of Scripture. And small groups do not, small groups do not uh, violate any passage, any passage of Scripture. Are you suggesting that we go to small groups because we're losing our Sunday night attendance? Right. Yeah. The, well, again, Sunday night's an expedient. And this is what I tell people all the time about Burleson is that we do what works best for us. I mean, do you know any other church that conducts their Sunday night service like we do? I don't. Does it, does it seem to work pretty well for us? I think it, you know, I think it does. You know, do I wish more people would come back? Yeah. Do I think changing what we do on Sunday night will make them come back? No. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think that, I don't think that's what, what the problem is. You know, I don't think the problem is our format. I think the problem is somebody's heart. Now, like you know, where Jeffrey and Ashley attend, I don't know if they have small groups every Sunday night, but I know that they, they do. Ron says she thinks they have them every Sunday night. You know? What's that? Northport. Northport has small groups. Look, you know, as as long as long as the eldership has oversight and main, you know, maintains, you know, maintains oversight of that, you know, in a good way. You know, the only argument I've ever heard against small groups is when churches have had, uh, uh, when churches have had uh, divisions that have arisen out of small groups. In other words, this small group has decided they're going to be a small group because they're all like-minded and they're not minded the rest of, like the rest of the church is, and then they're going to use that small group as a means to recruit people to their way of thinking. Now, that I've, I've seen that happen a lot. It happened in the church at East Wood Street, where, you know, where we used to be. It wasn't a formal small group, but you, you know, small groups can be helpful or detrimental no matter if they're on Sunday night or Monday night or, or you know, whatever night that they might be. Well, it would be it would be it would be helpful, but it wouldn't be necessary because we don't we don't have an elder in every Bible class, right? That small group at each one. And by the way, I think that's a, I think that's a wise a wise again not necessary but wise. Right. Right. Yeah, this is this is purely my this is purely my opinion. But if if a church were going to have small groups, those groups need to rotate. The people need to rotate into different groups because then you you do end up with clickishness if you have the same people together every single you know every single Sunday night. You, it 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 works that way. I mean, it's just natural for it to work that way. So you can prevent that by rotating, you know, mixing up the people in the in the groups. You know, if, if for nothing else, some random way of grouping people by whatever their last name start letter their last name starts with. That's pretty. That, you know, that's a pretty random way to to do it. Uh, you know, you could organize them by age if you're going to do it. For, say a year, all right? For for you know, for the first three months, we're going to do small groups by age. You know, we're going to put the twenty somethings together and the thirty somethings and. The, yeah, there's just, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but it, but the Bible doesn't doesn't speak to it. Um, but then again, there's also an advantage of grouping according according not necessarily to age, but to similarities, because then you can cater to that group. So, for example, you could have a small group of parents who have small children. Well, that'd be chaos. <laughs> I don't want to be a part of that small group. Well, just, just going to go ahead and cast my light right now. The, the group with all the little kids, I'm out. That's what I'm, saying. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ashley's I love. Small group yeah, yeah. Jeffrey and Ashley's small group caters to well, parents with small children. That's made them so much closer, and they help each other. Right. And, it and they use it as an evangelistic tool, which is really what it, you know, what all, everything should be. But it's so nice.
Now, going back to, uh, Ann mentioned something but she, in, in her question, but it wasn't intended in the context of the question. Talking about churches with big, nice buildings. Now, I want to know, churches may meet in houses for a number of reasons. All right? One could be finances. I mean, you know, the churches in Ghana, you know, have a hard time buying property and, and you know, and putting up a building. So, you know, a lot of the churches that I know of in Ghana meet in, a, in school classrooms because there's little schools everywhere. Just kind of like it used to be around here. You know, there's a school at Bud Hatchie and there's one at, you know, probably one at Pierce's Mill and Burleson. You know, there's little schools scattered everywhere. And the churches meet in a classroom somewhere. But they'll rent, you know, a classroom. Kofi Kwachi, that, their congregation met in a school classroom. you got to remember something. Their schools are, you know, they know... You know, ain't no doors on them, ain't no windows in them. I mean, you just, people could come and go. Uh, and so, and so, you know, sometimes people might meet because of financial reasons. You know, if you were going to be, I mean, think about if you were going to establish a church, say, in Singapore. I mean, that's one of the most expensive places in the world to live. You know, the church, you know, the, there's very little property to be bought there. You know, very, you know, it'd be, be prohibitive for the church to buy a place, right? So you'd have to find, you know, for financial reasons, you might need to meet in somebody's house or their apartment or condo or, or wherever it is uh, that they live. Uh, the matter of expediency. You know, if a church is small, why, you know, why does a small group of Christians need a building? When I say a small group, I mean less than 20. You know, what if a church gets started somewhere and there's you know, 15 or 20 of them? You know, do, they really need, do they really need to, to dedicate that much money? Again, this would also go back to financial. You know, do they really need to dedicate that much of their money to, you know, to uh, um, buying property or putting up a building? You know, I know a congregation in Georgia. It's a fairly new congregation, and they meet in the uh, they meet in the 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 I, I hate I hesitate to call it a barn, but it, it's a building about like the one next to Miss Bueller's house. You know, it's just a it's just a metal building with a concrete floor in it, and the church meets in there. One of the members, one of the members owns it, and they said, well, you, know, we, "You know, we'll meet. We can meet here as long as we need to meet." You know, so there's a big, you know, it's a, a big barn, so to speak. And uh, but again, finances and expediency, you know, would would uh, make that uh, necessary. Um, how about yeah? You know, in the Lord's church from 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 Pentecost, in my opinion, the main reason why that for a number. Yeah, and that's my third. That was my third one. Persecution. Yeah. You know, what if it's illegal for the church to meet? I mean, what if you, you know, what if you established a church in a Muslim country, you know, or or or, an, or a communist country, you know, like Myanmar or you know the old Soviet Union or China, you know. By the way, the churches, you know, the Lord's church exists in China. The Lord's church exists in Myanmar which is old, old Burma. If you're not familiar with Miramar, it's Burma. All right? The church exists in those places. You know, but they don't have a building with a big old sign out front. You know, if you were in northern Nigeria and you were dealing with the Muslims in Boko Haram, you know, you're not going to put a big sign on front there saying, you know, say, Christians meet here. You know, you're, just, you're, you're just begging to get that place shot up. And so you know, with matters of, with matters of uh, illegality to meet, or safety, you know, those are certainly those are certainly reasons why groups would meet, you know, in in houses. And by the way, you know, Jesus said we're to be wise as serpents and, and harmless as doves. You know, he you know he, he didn't say you know he didn't say we had to go out and put a bullseye on ourselves, you know, intentionally, you know, so that the government or the Muslims or somebody can come shoot up the place. And so you know, there's a lot of reasons, you know, financial, expedient. Illegal safety concerns, you know any, you know any number, any number of reasons why a church might choose to meet, uh, choose to meet uh, in a, you know, in a house. You know, a lot of the early churches in the uh, uh, the Restoration movement met in what they call brush arbors. You know, they just cleared out a spot and, you know, and and met. Question. Well, one of the realities that, that we live under, and, and I, and we, we should pray that it just doesn't happen. But I've said that if they continue to travel down the path they're on, they're, they're on right now, the church building may be a thing of the past even in America. 
Right. Right. I mean, a congregation might have to split and form five congregations in order to to you know to accommodate that. Yeah. But what Am, I was going to get what Am was talking about, and this kind of goes to the financial part. You know, a lot of churches they spend a lot of money on their buildings. So and so, what does that you know what does that create? Massive amounts of debt and upkeep. Right. I mean, you start seeing, you know, even some of our brethren in the last 20, 25 years, I've watched some of our brethren throw up facilities that cost anywhere between uh, 8 and $20 million. I mean, I'll just tell you, I'd have a hard time. I'd have a hard time trying to face the Lord in the day of judgment and explain to Him why I spent $20 million, you know, on, on, on a place to meet, you know, not including all the associated upkeep. You know, with uh, with you know with, with facilities like that. Again, that's their business. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. If it was me, I'd have a hard time trying to justify spending twenty million dollars for a place to meet. You know, it's just because it creates it creates more obligation. You know, when churches do those types of things, they create for them greater financial obligations. And you know, and that's not always you know that's not always expedient. Now look, for us. It's expedient for us to own a building. I mean, we got people, you know, we got people who come from 30 miles away. Some, you know, Matt and Ashley live, you know, last house in Alabama before you get to Mississippi. You know, Vince and them, you know, 30 miles or so uh, one way. You know, so many, you know, so many of our people drive a long way. When Kyle and Lexi, you know, had their house in Hale, it was a long way. You know, so it's expedient for us to have, you know, to have a place. Plus, you know, you know, the, just the, the size of the congregation would, would be prohibitive to meet in a house, you know, every, you know, every single week. But, uh, but there's a lot of reasons why people might choose to meet in houses, uh, but, uh, but I've never seen anybody in, among our people that opposed it. Are you volunteering your, your barn for us to meet in? Yes. All right. <laughs> I'll have to move them five weed eaters out of the way, but it will get her done. Yeah. Yeah. This building. And it really made a difference. Yeah, the location of this building without question has been helpful through the years. Without, without a doubt, it's, it's helpful. All right, any other thoughts or questions? All right, let me turn this off. I'm going to make mention of something real quick. Uh, 